All right. So my name is Jenny Pennington, and I'm one of the coordinators for NHD this year. And today we're going to talk about documentaries, and that is it. Okay, so if you've never done a documentary before, or you haven't done one in a while, or you just want a refresher, this will be a great little presentation for you, okay? Let's see. So, some reminders. Please remember that there is a theme, okay? This year's annual theme, you, I got the little, uh, little logo for this year, it's called Turning Points in History. That's all you get. Okay, it's up to you to take that theme and to turn it into something. So you're going to pick a topic that relates to the theme, but you need to make sure that you can defend why your project relates to that theme. And you also need to be able to argue some kind of historical opinion. Okay, so there's a lot of arguing going on. It's not a report. It's not a history paper. This is something totally different. Okay. It's brought on purpose because we want to get to know you, but also we want you to do stuff that you're interested in. If you're interested in science, pick something that's science-based. So there's medical things, space things, um, engineering things, like there's, there's a wide variety of things. If you're into pop culture, you can talk about celebrities, you can talk about music, art, whatever, okay? That's why it's so, kind of broad, I know it makes it hard, um, but it's that way on purpose. So what is a turning point? And what comes to mind when we think of a turning point? Um, me being a US history teacher, I always think of Revolutionary War, right? The Battle of Saratoga. It's a turning point because the war literally turns, right? It was a huge win for the US because then the French were like, oh, maybe they don't, stink as bad as we thought they did. They get the help from the French and it helps them win the war, right? Without that help, would they have won the war? No one really knows, but probably not, right? The definition is a time which a decisive change in a situation occurs, especially one with beneficial results. Is it always gonna be beneficial? I mean, probably for somebody, but not everybody, right? And that's where you can tie in that historical perspective piece. Sometimes change is not always good for everybody, but it is good for somebody. Does that make sense? Um, next, remember, these are other reminders. We've talked about these things before. Pick something you're passionate about because if you pick something that's boring and you hate it, your project is gonna reflect that, okay? Uh, match the theme. How is it a turning point in historical significance? Why is your topic, why is your turning point important to history? It doesn't have to be U.S. history, it could be world history, right? But you need to be able to argue why is it significant? Why does your project match the theme? Why is your opinion right? So there's a lot of arguing going on. Be specific, and of course, don't be afraid to ask for help, right? We do these workshops, we record them, they're up on YouTube. A lot of you have been watching them, I've noticed. Um, but we also have a lot of great links on our website, on Z Fairs, and you can email us at nhdaz at azhs.gov and we will help the best we can, right? Because if we don't know the answer, we probably know somebody that does. All right, so now we're down to the, the nitty gritty. This is a basic overview of what a documentary is. It's 10 minutes from the time you turn the video on until the time you turn it off. So that includes the title sequence and the ending credits, okay? If you go over 10 minutes, you are disqualified because that's in the rules, okay? But you can use pictures, you can use videos, you can use sounds, music, whatever, um, to communicate your historical argument, research, and interpretation of your topic and how it aligns with the theme. Notice how big and bold and capitalize that is and historical significance because that is super super important okay skills that you will need in order to produce your documentary you need to know how to use audio visual equipment so you need to know how to use a mic you need to know how to record you need to know how to use a computer i'm not very tech savvy so this is not something that i would do i'm a paper person because i like to write Play to your skills, okay? If you like doing 
the editing, the script writing, and working with technology, the documentary is great, okay? But also take into account your topic. If you don't think your topic is gonna have a lot of visuals, then maybe a documentary isn't the best idea. So think about that. If you're doing a more modern topic, you can do interviews, you can show pictures, newspapers, political cartoons, but we'll get in all of that here in just a second. This is kind of an abbreviated project schedule. So I start with November because that's where we are right now. You should already have your topic picked. You should have a rough draft of your historical um, argument research question, and you should have a rough draft of your thesis already. So in November, you're going to research, kind of evaluate and morph your thesis to match what you're wanting. Learn how to use your equipment because don't wait till the last minute to figure out what you're doing. Okay, practice with it. And then just write a brief synopsis. So a synopsis is essentially write me like a little summary of what you're trying to argue, why it's important, and what your whole documentary is going to be about. That'll help drive writing the rest of it. So next month, December, and I know it's going to be busy because of Christmas and all that stuff, but you got to keep pushing because that's when you need to finish your research, finish your bibliography, and get started on producing and creating your documentary. Now, remember, if you're doing an individual documentary, you got a little bit more heat on you because you have to do literally everything. If you're doing a group documentary, you get a little bit extra help. I'm not saying one is better than the other. I'm just saying that there's some opportunity cost there, if you know what I mean. Um, January, you need to revise. Use a test audience. Test audiences can give you feedback, okay? Use different, show your teacher, show your friends, show mom and dad, and ask them to give you honest and constructive feedback. Obviously, you don't want them to be like, oh my God, this is so great just because, right? You want real good feedback. And I'm sure if they support you, then they will. Make sure that you're following the rules. There was a lot of rule breaking last year and that's why a lot of kids didn't make it to state. Please, please, please read the rule book. And then in January, on January 1st, all Z fairs are open to registration for kids. Teachers, judges, and volunteers can go ahead and register. Um, and if you're an adult and you need help with that part, just email the, the NHD email, okay? Um, but if you're a kid, I walked through last time how to register for the fairs. So you already know what to do. All right, February, we're going to revise, double check our bibliography. I attached an MLA annotation guide. Do you have to use it? No. But I had a lot of friends who were like, I don't know what I'm doing. So this might help a little bit. You can use MLA or APA. They really don't care. Pick whichever one you're more comfortable with, okay? I think a lot of you guys use MLA, so. Um, and practice being interviewed. I know that that is the most nerve-wracking part for a lot of kiddos because you're st stuck in a room by yourself, essentially, and whoever's watching you with three adults who can be a little intimidating at times because, one, you don't know them, and two, they're supposed to be like experts, right? One, remember they don't bite, right? They're people. Um, two, they're literally there because they think that you do good things and they're there to support you, okay? But practice being interviewed. Have someone, we have some like questions judges might ask. Have your teacher practice interviewing you until you can kind of get comfortable and kind of craft some of those answers in your head. Right, so you're not just last minute making up answers in the end. February is when our contest starts. So our first contest is February 20th, 10th, February 10th in Yuma. That's our new contest this year, followed by East, West, South, North. North will be our last one. Like here, I said the last contest is 3:23. Okay, so the rest of them are kind of spaced in between there. Contest schedules are on Z fairs. So check there first, okay? In March, after your contest, if you make it to state, you need to start making revisions because the state materials are due on April 4th. So my friends who are in North, 
the turnaround time is super short, it's the best I could do, okay? Um, because we're having to avoid snow and Easter and all this other stuff. So you're going to have to buckle down, get it fixed really quick, get it turned back in, okay? All right. So one of the biggest things that I get questions about a lot is the audio, visual, music kind of aspect of it, okay? Here's some things you need to remember. It needs to add to the experience, right? We want the audience to be a part of the documentary and feel immersed in the time period and topic. You know, one of my favorite ones I like to think of is there is a World War One documentary on Netflix. And it has a bunch of oral histories and it's literally just a slideshow of pictures. But the, the narration and the timing of the pictures is done so well that you don't focus on that part. You focus on being kind of essentially like pulled into it. So make sure when you're adding stuff, you're not taking away from the experience. Two, you need to make sure it fits the mood. If you're talking about someone dying, you don't want Looney Tune music playing on in the back, right? So make sure you kind of read the room there. Though it's not required, because what we're doing is falls under the educational kind of um, loophole and copyright rules, I would use royalty-free music because if you don't, we can't post it anywhere. And make sure that when you cite music, that you're doing it for all of them, even if it's royalty-free music, right? If you can't, that's fine. We'll figure it out. But I, I strongly suggest royalty-free music because it makes everybody's life just that much easier, right? Every single thing you use needs to be included in your bibliography. Pictures, sounds, videos, whatever, research. Um, I'll show you an example of two different annotated bibliographies that, that Nationals gives to us to show to kids. One is 24 pages long and one is 42 pages long. So depending on your topic and the amount of stuff you put on there depends on how many sources you need to use. I don't have an exact number for you, but make sure that you're using enough. I don't think there's really a too much research, but if you're not using it, don't, don't put it in there, okay? Where can I find stuff? This is another big question I get. You have lots and lots of resources because we have a lot of organizations who are friends with us, who partner with us, and who have lots of great archives and collections and things like that. So always ask us first, say, hey, this is my topic. This is what I'm looking for. Can you help me? And we'll ask around. But if you have a local museum that might have something, even, even if you're not sure, just email them and ask. One, because they'll be delighted that you even asked. Um, but two, you, you might be surprised. There's a lot of great online databases. Um, there's the Arizona Memory Project. That's a great one that, that I use a lot in a lot of my research. Um, the Library of Congress, which is also on here, is another great one. Oral history collections. We have a lot of Arizona-based ones. Um, but you can pretty much, there's a great World War II one. Um, through the National World War II Museum that's in New Orleans. They have a great oral history collection. Um, and I feel like there's a couple others I can't think of off the top of my head, but that's the one that sticks out to me the most because I watch that one in my free time. The National Archives is great. Library of Congress is great. Or you can, you know, kind of like in the, the kind of history documentaries where it's kind of like pre-recording era and they don't have videos or anything and they do a lot of the like dramatizations where they have actors dress up as like Abraham Lincoln and stuff you can do that but it needs to be you guys doing it okay and you need to make sure that everything is recorded there's smooth transitions so there's a lot that's going to go into it but you can do it okay and when you're picking your topic, this is something you might want to consider. 
pre-recording versus recording, right? So pre-recording is like before 1850-ish, we don't have videos, we don't have new, like, you know, recordings, we don't have really any recordings of anything. But there is stuff you can use. There's art, artifacts, newspapers, political cartoons. Those are so awesome to use, especially when you're talking about kind of controversial topics that are like heavily argued. Political cartoons have so much bias in them that it's almost like a little bordering ridiculous, right? But those are great to kind of use to get points of views across. If you're trying to do that kind of historical perspective piece, I think those are really great. Um, historic documents, maps, music from the time. Does it have to be played by someone who was there? No. It can be a recording of someone playing Mozart or whatever. Like it doesn't have to be that. But like I said, try to make it royalty free music because that makes everybody's life easier. Um, if you can get an interview with an expert, like I remember last year we had a little kid who did an interview, I think it was with an ASU professor. And um, he included some of that research in his website. But like if, if they're okay with it, and they'll let you interview them, that's totally fine. But make sure that they're a good source that's going to add to your documentary, not take away. Does that make sense? And don't make it the majority of your documentary. It's a good kind of addition, but don't make it the whole thing. And then, of course, there's the recording era, which is kind of after 1850. We got lots of video clips, news reports like actual news, like clippings and stuff like that, newspapers, TVs, recordings, political cartoons, oral histories. Like I said, those are, those are a great resource. So you have options either way. Just keep those things in mind. If you're wanting to do something that's like way, way back when, remember, you need to have primary sources, but also if you're doing a documentary, you need to have visuals and you need to have audio. So take those types of things into consideration. One of the things I strongly, strongly recommend doing is building a storyboard, okay? So I kind of laid it out for you. So you start with your intro. What you're gonna do is you're gonna tell me what you're, or tell yourself, you're gonna have, what images am I gonna show? What's the audio gonna be? So for example, if it's your intro, you want it to say, here is a painting of brass, with the documentary title and the audio is gonna be piano music or whatever. It's, it's, it's literally an outline for you. So it doesn't matter. You need to make sure you have your hook. So how are you gonna get people's attention? What's your argument, your thesis statement? How is this connected to the theme? Don't be afraid to literally say, this is a turning point, okay? They are looking for that. Come out and say it. Use the theme words because they love that, okay? And then what kind of transition are you going to make? Is it going to be like literally just a little silent stop? Or are you going to have some music playing? Think about it because you want those transitions to be smooth, right? Then you're going to do your arguments. So you should have three. So you're going to do this three times and it's the exact same thing. What images and audio are you going to have playing? What's the argument? What evidence are you going to show? What's the connection to the theme and what's your transition? So you're going to do that for the three argument points or however many you got. I always say do three. I think that's a sweet spot. And then your conclusion. What images, music, whatever you're going to have playing. What's your conclusion? Again, connect to the theme. You see why that's important now? And any closing thoughts? And then after that is where you're gonna have your credits. And I have, we'll talk about credits here in a second. Does that make sense? Once you kind of have the general theme figured out, and kind of how you want the layout of your documentary to go, start writing your script. You should start doing this, I think about, well, probably December, writing your script. Yeah, because December you're finishing your research, you're doing your bibliography. So about December is when you should start writing your script. Write it 
how you would say it. Don't, I mean, if, if that's the way you think. For me, I need to write exactly what I'm going to say or like I forget what my bullet points mean. Um, but if, if you can do bullet points, that's fine too. But so this is an example of how I would do a script, right? How much time is this going to take? So if this particular thing is going to take, I put five seconds. It's going to be on the screen for five full seconds. This helps you plan to make sure that you're not going over your 10 minutes too. What visuals are you going to see? So again, documentary title with a painting of a grass field. Um, the music that's going to be playing, which is going to be piano music, and what narration is going to be spoken in the voiceover. Because this is the opening, I'm literally just saying the name of the title of the, my project. I just made something up. So this is a uh, triangle waste fire catastrophe. Um, when you do your intro, all you need to say is your title, who did it, and that's it. And then you just let it play. Um, you can do your intro after the title sequence. Do I have to cite everything? Yes. Please cite every single thing that you use. Try to cite the original content. So for example, if you go to the Library of Congress's YouTube page, don't cite the YouTube page. Try to find it on their website, okay? Another thing is Google is not a source. Google Images is like saying that you went to the library and got a book, okay? There's so, no, that's not gonna happen. You need to figure out where it came from and then you cite that website. Do not cite Google Images, please. And if you can't figure out where it comes from, you're gonna have to find something different, okay? Because as soon as they sing, see Google Images in your annotated bibliography, it's over, okay? <laughs> Um, your citation. So they're going to, you technically have to show them twice, but in different ways. Okay. So of course you got to do your annotated bibliography, which is like the formal citation with like a two sentence explanation, how and why you picked this resource and how you used it. But in the credits, you don't need to like include the entire bibliography, but just like a general list so for example, you'll put, and I'll show you an example of like what a credit page looks like. You'll put written and produced by, edited by, narrated by, and then like, if you use the Library of Congress for a lot of resources, put Library of Congress, Arizona Historical Society, like all institutions that you used a lot of their stuff or any interviewees that you, you interviewed or where you got oral histories from, include those, but like just put the name. So for example, like this, you'll put the documentary title up the top, produced and edited by me, whatever your name is, narrated by Kristen, interviews taken from Kathy Schumart, interviews conducted with Grandpa Joe, like, you know what I mean? Music from, and if you, wherever you got the music from, okay? And if you want to do a special thanks at the end, maybe include your teacher because they're dedicating an incredible amount of time and energy and money and blood and sweat and tears in this thing, that might be a good place to do it. All right. We're past the building documentary part, okay? We're going straight into Z-Fairs. You can find all the Z-Fairs links here on the Arizona Historical Society website, but also, um, they're gonna get posted on YouTube in a couple of days, probably. Yes, I think next week. All the lockout dates are gonna be less listed on the ZFair pages. They're all different. I'm not gonna sit here and list them all out. Go look on ZFairs. It's all listed on there, okay? What do I need to get registered? So for documentaries, it's a $35 registration fee. All of them are a $35 registration fee. Is this different from last year? Yes, but it is $35 this year. Written materials. You need to have your process paper and your annotated bibliography. If you do not know anything about the process paper, go read the rule book. They're really easy. They're great. 
I absolutely love them, okay? Because it, it kind of gets me in your brain. How did you write this project? What inspired you to write this project? Things like that. I absolutely love them. And then, so we're doing things a little different last, than last year. So last year we didn't show the documentaries, but we wanna do that this year. So there's two things that you're gonna have to do. You need to make sure that your documentary link is uploaded into ZFairs so that we can judge it, okay? You need to submit your documentary whenever your lockout date is, okay? You also need to bring your documentary on a jump drive, just in case. Um, hopefully most places will already just have a computer and a TV set up. That way we can just click on the link and go and you can show it. Um, but just in case, make sure you have a jump drive, okay? And if the documentary on your jump drive is different than the one that the judges got beforehand, they are not going to judge based off of that one. They're going to judge you based off of the one that got submitted on ZFairs. So remember that. If you make changes, they're not going to count. Contest day. So like I said, it's going to be a little different. Make sure you bring copies, like physical copies of your written materials for judges. They like to write on them stuff. Um, make sure you dress nice um, and make sure you smile. I know it's a little nerve wracking, um, but everybody there is there to support you and they're excited about you being there. So yeah, have a good time. Make sure you're prepared. I always say bring a laptop just in case. If you have one, if not, don't worry about it. Bring a copy of your documentary on a flash drive or some other form of little storage device. That way we can just plug it in and go. I say flash drive because you never know what kind of computer there's going to be. And it'll just that'll just make everything easy. When you pull up your documentary, test the volume first before you start playing it. Okay. Make sure you're not going to blow people away. Just, just for general. Okay. They'll give you a start signal, and then after the start signal, you'll introduce yourself and the title of your documentary. Don't say anything else, okay? Because remember, the documentary needs to be a standalone. So you introduce yourself, the documentary, turn around, turn it on, right? Then right after that, they'll do your interview. It's, it'll be super, super short, right? It's no big deal. They're just asking questions to get to know you better, to get to know your research better, things like that. And the, the interview cannot hurt you. The interview can only help you, okay? Because you can provide a little bit more clarification on things and stuff, right? Um, just answer the questions the best you can. Hopefully you prepare a little bit so that you feel more confident, but it's it's not a big deal. Don't sweat it. Like I said, they're literally there because they think what you do is great. So don't, don't even sweat it. Things that you should consider when doing your documentary. If possible, think about doing oral histories or interviews, right? If you're doing a more modern project and you have access to people who could be considered a great primary source, use those people, right? If you're talking about uh, women serving in the military during World War II and you're great, great aunt Sally who lives is still alive and lives here in Arizona interviewer right um what else look into controversial topics remember this is an argument project you need to make a statement and you need to defend it this is not a report don't tell me what happened Tell me why what happened is a turning point in history and why that particular turning point is so, so important, okay? Always use a few different test audiences. Don't use the same one over and over again, right? You want to get as many as a, of opinions as you can get. So try mom and dad, try your teacher, try your friends, try your dog. Well, maybe not your dog because they can't give you feedback. But, you know, switch it up. Make sure your link is a public link. Y'all about killed me last year with these Google Drive links. If your school will not let you share outside of the school, you need to use a like your private 
Gmail account. And if you don't have one, they're super easy to make, okay? If you do not have access to your stuff outside of a school computer, that means I don't either. So you need to make sure that you somehow get it to me in a way that anybody who clicks on that link can have access to it. Because y'all, like I said, y'all about killed me last year because I kept getting links that I couldn't get into and we couldn't figure it out. And no, you need to make sure that it is a public link. Most school systems will not let you share stuff outside of the school system. So I recommend putting everything on your personal Google Drive. Okay. When you sign up for Z fairs, use your personal email if you do not have access to your school emails at home. Okay because I wanna make sure you're getting all of the information that you can. Make sure that you put mom and dad's email in there too and make sure that it's right because I had a lot of parent emails that were wrong last year. So make sure you're double checking everything. And then make sure you bring your jump drive, rip materials and smile because it's fun. And this is a great thing to do. And I think it's really incredible that you guys put this much time and effort and energy into these projects and they're so good, okay? Um, here's some resources I got for you. I'm not gonna click on them. If you wanna look at them, they're on the nhd.org website. You just literally type in documentary into the little search bar and this stuff pops up. But this is a checklist to make sure that you're rule compliant. So make sure that you're following all of the rules. An oral history guidelines. Um, I kind of figured if you've never done an oral history, I've never done an oral history before. So I thought these were really great rules um, to share with you guys if that's something that you're looking to doing. So if you want to interview great, great Aunt Sally, here's how you do it. Okay. Um, and then the rubric. I love being able to know how I'm being graded beforehand, right? I'm sure most of your teachers always give you the rubric before projects and stuff like that. Um, because you can kind of just build off of it, right? Like, okay, I made sure that I have my historical argument in there. I can, I know for sure that there is historical perspective, things like that, okay? Um, so those are there. I'm going to upload the PowerPoint with this video on the azhs.gov or dot, is it dot org? Yeah, azhs.org website. I've showed you how to get there a million times. If you don't know how, go to the other video, okay? All right, so I'm gonna show a couple examples. Now, these are from two years ago, okay? Um, first, we're gonna look at their written materials though. Let me figure out how to, can you see my, yeah, you can see it, okay. Like I said, this this is 24 pages long. Okay, this is their title page. Does it have to be fancy like this? No. I was actually surprised that it was because I have never seen this before, like fancy kind of like this before, but that's okay. Has their name, division, what kind of project it is, and how many words are in their process paper. This stuff is all required. So if you do not have this, this means that you are breaking the rules and you're disqualified. So make sure that you're paying attention. So this is their process paper. We're not really gonna read it that much, but it, it's 500 words. And how do I know that? It's on the title page. This is their bibliography. Now, if you noticed, it starts with primary sources annotated. These are the periodicals that they used. And there's a little, there's the citation with a little bit how they use the article, okay? audio visuals, so like music, things like that. I say if you can avoid citing YouTube, okay? This particular group may have not had anything like posted anywhere. So like, I'm not saying it's illegal or anything, but if you can find it somewhere else, like on their website or something like that, try to do that. So periodicals, audio, video, visuals, they use a lot of videos. Keep scrolling. Yeah, 
There we go, secondary sources. Interviews. Audiovisuals. Now, if you are not sure the difference between a, and then it just has kind of additional sources. And these are probably ones that they just kind of used in their research and trying to get their argument and stuff together. If you're not sure about the difference between a primary source and a secondary source, I think we have a video on our YouTube channel, I'm not 100% sure. But the main difference is a primary source is someone who was physically there or something that was physically there. So for example, if I take a picture of a civil rights parade in 1964 and my project is about some particular event around the same time, that's primary source. But if I'm interviewing the daughter of somebody who was there, that's a secondary source because that person was not physically there. If I'm interviewing an expert about something that happened during the Civil War, that's still a secondary resource because they were not there during the Civil War, right? All right, so. We're gonna watch the documentary. Like I said, they're 10 minutes long. We probably won't watch the whole thing, but that way you can kind of get an idea if it'll load. Can you hear it? In Article 1, Section 8 of the United States Constitution, tribal governments are recognized as independent sovereign nations. This autonomy empowers Native Americans to determine criteria for tribal citizenship, draft and enforce laws, and self-govern. However, as the U.S. expanded west into Native territory beginning in the late 18th century, stolen land and the erosion of Native American sovereignty sparked a debate on Indigenous rights that reached its peak during the 1970s. The American Indian Movement's occupation of the Bureau of Indian Affairs building in 1972 was a watershed moment in the debate for Indigenous self-determination. AIM activists demanded that the Bureau of Indian Affairs abandon its focus on native assimilation and treat tribal governments as sovereign nations. AIM used diplomatic approaches, debate, and direct action to pressure President Richard Nixon to affirm tribal self-governance. During westward expansion, the United States Senate drafted more than 350 diplomatic treaties intended to protect native sovereignty. In 1824, the War Department created the Bureau of Indian Affairs, or the BIA, to manage treaties with tribal governments. However, the U.S. prioritized expansion over its legal and moral obligations and began seizing native territory, ultimately reneging on all 350 treaties. In the first half of the 20th century, the United States government determined that Native Americans should be assimilated into dominant white culture. BIA Commissioner Glenn Emmons introduced the relocation program in 1948 to move Native Americans from reservations into white dominant urban areas. The 1952 Urban Indian Relocation Act promised employment and housing via informational pamphlets distributed by urban relocation offices. However, when Natives arrived in American cities, they found few economic and social opportunities. You know, they were rounded up, forcibly removed from their areas, uh, marched at gunpoint to uh, different places, which were basically rock piles in the middle of nowhere. In 1953, still pursuing assimilation strategies, Congress passed House Resolution 108 and Public Law 280, which introduced a new policy called termination. Termination removed more than 1 million acres of reservation land from federal protection and eliminated the tribal status of 100 indigenous nations. Influenced by the nascent civil rights movement, Native Americans began to call for justice. The Vietnam War also influenced their perspective as thousands of Native Americans were sent to defend American freedom, a right they had never experienced. Native youth founded the Red Power Movement to amplify Indian voices in the 1950s. The Red Power Movement led protests and demanded self-determination over Native educational and cultural development. The Red Power Movement gave rise to several organizations that joined the fight for Native rights the most prominent being the American Indian Movement, or AIM, which was founded in July 1968 in Minneapolis by Russell Means, Dennis Banks, and Clyde Belcourt. At the time, 
One of the, the most impactful things that I think that this particular documentary does is that when it's necessary, there's captions down at the bottom. So you can kind of get an idea of what's happening. So for example, like there was one photo that it wasn't very clear. So they put a caption like what was happening in that photo. When the, the lady that they interviewed popped on, they put who she was, her credentials. And so that kind of tells us, hey, this is someone that we should be listening to about this topic because she's a part of this major lobbying group. Um, so she knows all about this, right? Then we're going to fast forward. Like I said, if you want to watch this in your free time, that is that is totally great. But we're going to fast forward so you can kind of see. Um, see, this is another one right there. You see the caption at the bottom? I think that's great. Um, so you can kind of see what their uh, credits look like. I can... In Article 1. Determination. However, the American Indian Movement's 1972 occupation of the BIA called attention to the government's historic abrogation of treaties, brought the debate over tribal sovereignty to American headlines, and laid the groundwork for diplomacy between Native Americans and the federal government. So that's one really great example. And then I will go ahead and watch this other one. Now, this is the one that I was telling you, their written materials are 42 pages long and they have a more modern topic. They talk about, um, what is their title? 60 years of hardball debate and baseball diplomacy between Cuba and the United States. Because if you know, a lot of great American baseball players aren't actually American um that their cultures are uh, like the my favorite baseball player he's Dominican Republican so they're not from America and so this was a great kind of diplomacy piece and back then that was that that was the thing so that they they divided it periodicals books interviews things like that so when you build your annotated bibliography this is pretty much what it's going to look like photographs so, for example, like if I'm a judge and I'm like, I want to know where they got this one particular picture from, I would be able to go in here and look, right? And I would be able to see, right, it says, this is a photograph of a crowded Cuban baseball stands from, during the 1999 exhibition game in Havana, right? So it tells me what it is and how they used it. Okay, so we're going to go back and we're going to watch a little bit of this one. I'm excited because I love baseball. And I have not watched these yet. The one constant through all the years, Ray, has been baseball this field this game it's a part of our past ray it reminds us of all that once was good and it could be again the power of sports has long been harnessed to improve diplomatic relations between countries the history of baseball diplomacy between the united states and cuba is a compelling example it is a history of successful attempts and missed opportunities by both countries to use baseball as a diplomatic tool following the Castro Revolution. It reveals the human consequences of those efforts as Cuban athletes, their families, their fans, and the sport of baseball itself continue to be caught in the crosshairs of these ongoing diplomatic debates. Two countries less than 100 miles apart. Two countries whose shared passion for baseball dates back to the early 1900s when Cuban barnstormers entertained fans throughout the United States and Cuba. Cuban fans were treated to the talented Jackie Robinson at El Gran Stadium playing for the Montreal Royals, months before he'd break the color barrier in the United States. But the relationship was soon to change. In 1959, Fidel Castro came to power in Havana, overthrowing the regime of Fulgencio Batista. By 1965, 
Castro had positioned himself as the dictator of a full-fledged communist nation. During the half-century of Cold War politics that followed, successive U.S. administrations isolated Cuba economically and diplomatically. This isolation impacted what had been a symbiotic relationship between Cuban and American baseball. For the baseball-loving Castro, the events magnified the importance of baseball to Cubans. Castro saw sport as an extension of his revolution, capable of of building patriotic spirit at home and emphasizing ongoing international propaganda triumphs abroad. As a means to that end, Castro replaced professional baseball with Equipo Cuba, the country's beloved national team that dominated global competition for decades. For Cubans, Equipo Cuba offered a means of individual expression, a way to compete, to achieve in a non-capitalist society. At the same time, Major League Baseball saw a decade of expansion as the two leagues were split into Eastern and Western divisions, and additional teams such as the New York Mets were formed. Given the importance of baseball in both nations, the chasm between the two countries would need to be bridged, even as the Cold War between them intensified. Over the decades ahead, both the Cuban and U.S. governments and Major League Baseball attempted to use the sport as a diplomatic tool. In May, So one thing about this one in particular is I think they have a great script. They are very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They're really adamant about what their thesis is. They said that baseball was a great tool for diplomacy for Cuba and America. So they, they really, really throw that, um, that thesis in there a lot, okay? And then um, also I like how they kind of started with, and I don't totally recommend this because of copyright reasons, but like that movie clip at the beginning, I'm sure there's some copyright rules around that. So if you got copyright questions, that's something maybe you wanna research a little bit. Um, but that was their hook. It kind of drew you into it, right? They have lots of great visuals. Um, this is in the kind of like, I guess the 70s, the late 60s, 70s. So like there's a lot of great pictures and things like that too. 1970. What I wanted to say, wait. The one constant through all the years, Ray. There we go. Okay. Okay. So. That's all I have. If you have questions, please email us, okay? NHDAZ at azhs.gov. Even if you don't think we don't, even if you think we don't have the answer, like shoot it anyway, because if we don't got it, somebody does, okay? Some helpful links I have on here is the NHDAZ website. That's on the Arizona Historical Society's website. I've showed you how to get there a few times. If you need help, go watch the video. Okay, from I think it was what two weeks ago. I show you exactly every single thing that's on that that website. Okay, um, then NHDAZ YouTube. That's where all these these videos come back. Okay, um, the NHD website. This is the actual like national website. They have so many great resources. That's where I get a lot of my stuff from. Okay, so if you're doing a documentary, just go up there, type in the search bar documentary and everything that they have will pop up. Okay, the Library of Congress is an amazing resource. Even if you're doing something that's barely connected with American history, it's probably in there. Okay, so always check there, check National Archives, um, check as many free databases that you can. And if you can't find what you're looking for, hit us up because we probably know somebody or somebody we know knows somebody, right? That, that's what the support system's all about. Ask your teachers, they may know somebody. And then if you wanna sign up for office hours, we do have a sign up form. Give us about a two week head, like, head start from when you want your appointment and when you submit it. That way that gives us enough time to confirm whether we got, we got that free time or not. Um, we can't guarantee that we can do the, all the appointments but it's a great resource. Also work with your teachers, right? They're there to support you. We have amazing teachers who have been doing this for a long time and we have amazing teachers who have only done this a few times. Um, 
And if they can't help you, you know what they're gonna do? They're gonna reach out to us. And either way, you're gonna get the help you need, right? Does anybody have any questions? I think we're good then. Okay, well, I thank you so much for hanging out with me. Like I said, if you have questions, email me, okay? Have a good one.